welcome to day three of the um, my online event, Amberlynn, the Women Behind the Myths. Um, good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning um, to you wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, it's rather late for me. It's uh, just the clock tower has just chimed midnight here. Um, so yes, and I'm in my Christmas party gear. We had a, a Christmas lunch today. Um, so uh, yes, I'm still in my party gear. So, so yes. So today in day three, after final day, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the myths that surround Queen Anne Boleyn, some of the ideas that are quite prevalent sometimes um, in fiction, online, and in some history books as well. So it's going to be a long one. I'm going to be taking them one by one and I'm going to be challenging these ideas with history, what we know from history. Um, I'm going to cover all sorts. Um, did Anne Boleyn have six fingers on one hand? Uh, did she carry a deformed fetus? Um, did she miss... Um, uh, get my words out. Did she miscarry a deformed fetus in January 1536? Did she have a lot of miscarriages? Was she corrupted in France during her time in France? Did she have a stepmother? Was Anne Boleyn a flirt and an unsuitable queen? Was she charged with witchcraft? And did she commit incest? And so on. I'm going to be trying to cover quite a lot uh, tonight. Now, thank you for joining me. Um, if you've watched my other two lives, you'll know that um, I ask you to leave um, your questions until I open up for questions and then to put a queue in front of your question uh, so that I can just see it as I scroll down through all the comments. Right, okay, so this is going to be a, a long one. This is going to be a good ride, though. I have quite a few myths to get through. Okay. Number one, let's have a look at the idea that Anne Boleyn had six fingers on one hand, that extra finger. Now, I've mentioned this in the uh, pre my previous talks. Um, as I explained in my previous talks, there is absolutely no contemporary um, evidence of Anne Boleyn having an extra finger on one hand. The origin of this myth is a book, as I said, written by a Catholic in exile, Nicholas Sander. He wrote a book, The Rise of the Anglican Schism, which was uh, yes, all about um, yeah, the break with Rome, that schism in the church. He wrote it in 1585, and it was very anti-Protestant uh, propaganda. Um, in this book, in this book, which he, um, I went all Tudor and then, didn't I? In this book, in this book that he wrote in Latin, um, Sanders stated that Anne had an extra finger on her right hand, as well as a projecting tooth and a wen, um, and lots of other things. And so this was, he was writing propaganda at um, the time. It was aimed at blackening Queen Elizabeth I, who was, of course, the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. And in this book, he, um, yeah, it was, it was just propaganda against Elizabeth and what she stood for and her parents. And he also, I mean, this was a man that was urging Philip of Spain to invade England, you know, to bring back Catholicism. He was very much against um, Protestant Elizabeth I, and he was very much against the Reformation. And the only other mention of um, there being anything unusual about um, Anne's fingers um, is in a treatise written by George White, who I mentioned the other day as well. Um, that's, that is, the, his mention in that is believed to have been actually in response to Sanders' work. Um, and Wyatt wrote, upon the side of her nail, upon one of her fingers, some little show of a nail, 
which yet was so small by the report of those that have seen her, as the workmaster seemed to leave it on occasion of greater grace to her hand, which with the tip of one of her other fingers might be, and was usually hidden without any least blemish to it. So we don't really know the entire truth, whether Wyatt knew that Amberlynn definitely had some kind of um, difference on her on one of her fingers, or whether he was just trying to write something to defend Amberlynn against um, Sander's work. And it is a complete myth, by the way, that Am brought in into fashion long sleeves so that, you know, she could hide her fingers. That is a complete myth. It's also a complete myth that green sleeves was written about her. Um, that actually uh, dates to a later period. Now, an extra finger seems absolutely nothing to us in our more enlightened times, well, hopefully more enlightened times. But Tudor people, of course, were very, very superstitious. These were days when even a baby's wet nurse, because, for example, a queen, someone important, um, would have a wet nurse. She wouldn't breastfeed the child herself. She would have a wet nurse. And even a baby's wet nurse was vetted really well. Um, they had to be considered to be of good character, as it was believed that their characteristics would be passed on um, in the breast milk. Um, and also pregnant women were supposed to avoid um, awful sights, scary sights or vivid paintings, um, any bad sights and potential scares, because it was believed that if they had a scare, if they saw something awful, that it would cause a deformity in the baby. So there's no way that Henry VIII, that I can see of, would risk a deformity being passed on to his child, the heir to the throne, because an extra finger was seen as a deformity in those times. So extra finger, I don't think so. Okay, myth number two. This is regarding Anne Boleyn actually having a stepmother. Now, I occasionally encounter this online. I occasionally get asked this. And it's a storyline that appears in some historical um, novels. Um, I think it appears in Jean Plady's Lady in the Tower. Um, and the idea has its roots in the work of Victorian historian Agnes Strickland. And it's been repeated in later works. Um, such as Hester Chapman's biography of Anne Boleyn, which was written in the 1970s, I believe. And Joanna Denny also mentions it in her biography of Anne. Um, in the 19th century, Agnes Strickland wrote, the first misfortune that befell Anne was the loss of her mother, Lady Boleyn, who died in the year 1512 of puerperal fever, or puerperal fever. Sir Thomas Boleyn married again, at what period of his life we have no record, but it is certain that Anne's stepmother was a Norfolk woman of humble origin. So she's saying there that Elizabeth Howard, Elizabeth Boleyn, uh, died of childbed fever, and then Thomas married again. And Strickland cites her sources for this. Agnes Strickland was very good at citing her sources. Um, she cites her sources for Elizabeth's death in 1512 and Thomas Boleyn's second marriage as Tom's Traditions, Camden Society and Howard Memorials by Mr. Howard of Corby. And I, I actually looked these up and found that Tom's states, um, Queen Elizabeth had numerous maternal relations, and many of them among the inferior gentry, particularly in Norfolk, an inconvenience which arose from her father having selected for his second consort a subject of no very elevated extraction, whilst the blood of the Boleyns was widely diffused by the intermarriages of numerous junior branches. Now, as historian Philip Sargent points out in his book, The Life of Anne Boleyn, it appears that Strickland misread Tom's here. It is clear that he's actually talking about 
um, Henry VIII's second marriage to Anne Boleyn. He's talking about Queen Elizabeth's father's second marriage. He's not talking about her grandfather's second marriage. Um, he's not talking about Thomas Boleyn having a second marriage. And Philip Sargent also discusses Agnes Strickland's second source, the Howard Memorials, which is a privately printed um, history of the Howard family. And it records Elizabeth Howard, wife of Thomas Boleyn, as dying of childbed fever on the 14th of December, 1512, and being buried at Lambeth. But it's just not true. It doesn't tie with what we know from contemporary sources. We know from John Hussey's correspondence with Lady Lyle, this is Lady Honor Lyle, um, who was in Calais with her husband at the time, and John Hussey was their sort of London correspondent. He had to keep them up to date on things in London. He wrote to them of Elizabeth Boleyn's death. Um, he wrote that she died on the 3rd of April, 1538, and was buried at Lambeth, St. Mary's Church, Lambeth, on the 7th of April, 1538. And in 2018, Elizabeth Boleyn's ledger stone was rediscovered at Lambeth in the former church of St. Mary. It's not a church anymore. It's now a garden museum. And this ledger stone reads, here live, the Lady Elizabeth Howard, sometime Countess of Wiltshire. So Elizabeth Boleyn definitely survived until 1538. But there was a Howard woman who died in December 1512. And this was Elizabeth's sister, Muriel, who died either in childbirth or shortly after childbirth and who was buried at Lambeth. So the Howard memorials, I think, must simply have confused Elizabeth with her sister, Muriel. So Anne Boleyn did not have a stepmother. The woman, the mother that she was worried about when she was um, arrested and taken to the Tower of London and was worrying about her mother was Elizabeth Howard, um, Elizabeth Boleyn, Thomas Boleyn's only wife. So no stepmother. Now let's move on to a juicy one. This is the idea that Anne Boleyn was corrupted during her time in France and that she used her French ways, uh, definite euphemism there, um, to seduce Henry VIII. Now, in her biography of Mary Boleyn, um, Alison Weir writes that in 1535, King Francis I confided in Rodolfo Pio, saying how little virtuously she has always lived and now lives, and that Henry VIII told Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, that after he'd begun sexual relations with Anne Boleyn, he had, according to Alison Weir, found out that she had been corrupted in France. Those are Weir's words. Weir goes on to say that when Henry VIII was offered a French bride after Anne Boleyn's execution, he said that he had too much experience of French bringing up and manners referring to Anne. Now, in 1535, so let's look at the history behind this idea. In 1535, Pio did write of how King Francis I spoke three days ago of the new Queen of England, how little virtuously she has always lived and now lives. So he said that. But I found absolutely no mention in any of Chapuis' dispatches regarding Henry VIII believing that Anne had been corrupted in France. I just can't find a reference for Chapuis saying that at all. Paul Friedman, who was um, Anne Boleyn's 16th century biographer, writes, after the death of Anne, a courtier told Chapuis, so Chapuis reports, that Henry had refused the hand of the daughter of Francis I, the daughter being Madeleine of Valois, because she was too young and because in the said concubine he had had too much experience of what the corruption of France was. 
And this is based on a dispatch from July 1536, which stated in regards to Henry VIII marrying Madeleine, the king replied that she was too young for him and that he'd had too much experience of French bringing up and manners, alluding to the late concubine to take her to wife. Now, to me, my personal opinion, I think it's rather a leap to take the words French bringing up and manners as referring to anything at all sexual um, when it's a princess of France that's being discussed here, Madeleine of Valois being discussed here. Henry VIII just doesn't want another wife with French styles and manner mannerisms. Um, plus, you know, he, he wasn't thinking of um, marrying a French woman anyway. He After Anne Boleyn's execution, he had someone in the wings, didn't he, already? Um, and we certainly cannot use Chapuis dispatch as evidence that Anne Boleyn had been corrupted. As for Rodolfo Pierre, he was um, a papal nuncio at Francis I's court, and he always wrote about Anne Boleyn and her family with disdain. And we don't know if what he said was true or if Francis I even said that or what, what happened there at all. We don't know the truth behind that. However, Anne Boleyn, her time in France was, was first spent um, serving Mary Tudor for those few months that Mary Tudor was queen. And then she moved on to the service of Queen Claude, Francis I's wife. And Queen Claude was known for her piety, her strict household. And Claude spent most of her time pregnant and away from the French court. She preferred to spend her time at the chateaus of Blois and Amboise in the Loire Valley. Um, and there's no hint at all of any scandal being attached to Anne Boleyn at this time. Um, Anne, surely, if there was any scandal um, attached to Anne in France, surely Anne wouldn't have then been appointed to serve Queen Catherine of Aragon as a maid of honour. Um, Anne's reputation surely would have followed her back to England. So I think we can put that idea that Anne was corrupted in France and we can put that to bed and forget that. Okay, let's move on to Anne Boleyn's pregnancies. Now, I often see people commenting on social media that um, on the idea of Anne Boleyn's pregnancies and her miscarriages as if she'd had many that she had a series of miscarriages. But Anne Boleyn actually didn't. While Catherine of Aragon had at least six pregnancies between, oh, I think, 1509 when she married Henry VIII and 1518, Anne Boleyn, during her time as Henry, the, uh, Henry VIII's um, wife, had three pregnancies. So that's a three-year marriage to Henry VIII and three pregnancies. Let's go through these pregnancies. So her first pregnancy, um, and actually she was pregnant um, at their official marriage in January 1533. I believe that actually Edward Hall's right that there was some kind of marriage ceremony in November 1532 after they'd returned from Calais. Um, that first pregnancy resulted, of course, in the birth of a healthy baby girl, a little girl who grew up to be, obviously, the iconic Queen Elizabeth I. And she was born at Greenwich on the 7th of September, 1533. Anne appears to have become quickly pregnant again, for at the end of January, 1534, Chapuis reported that Anne was pregnant. In April 1534, George Taylor wrote to Lady Lyle, who is in Calais, of the Queen's goodly belly. And in July 1534, George Boleyn, um, Lord Rochford, Anne Boleyn's brother, was sent to France to ask for a postponement 
of a meeting between Henry VIII and Francis I due to Anne's condition. It was said that she's she being so far gone with child, she could not cross the sea with the king. And Chapuis also refers to Anne's pregnancy again in that same month in July 1534. However, nothing more is said about Anne Boleyn's pregnancy until that September, September 1534, when Chapuis reports that the king had begun to doubt her pregnancy and so had renewed and increased the love he formerly had for a beautiful damsel of the court. Um, there's no report of Anne taking to her chamber. This is what queens would do in the last few weeks of pregnancy. They would take to their chamber. They would kind of go into confinement with their ladies and prepare for the birth of their baby. There's no, there's the report of her doing that in 1533, August 1533 for Elizabeth's birth, but there's no report of her taking to her chamber in 1534. So perhaps Anne had a premature stillbirth that um, just wasn't written about, that was kept quiet considering what had happened to Catherine of Aragon. Or perhaps she had a phantom pregnancy, and that's why we have Chapuis talking about the king doubting her pregnancy. We, we just don't know what happened. There's just nothing in the records. Now, although some state that Anne was pregnant again in 1535, this is actually due to a misdating of a letter in the archives. It was said that Sir William Kingston uh, wrote to Lord Lyle. The Lyle letters are a fantastic source of um, of for for this period. By the way, I just I've got all of the volumes of the Lyle letters. I use them so much. Fantastic resource. Sir William Kingston wrote to Lord Lyle in June 15, 1535, apparently, saying that her grace has as fair a belly as I have ever seen. However, in that same letter, Kingston refers to Sir Christopher Garnies, who had in fact died in October 1534. So this letter wasn't written in June 1535. It's been misstated in the archives. It must have been written in June 1534 before Garnies' death. And then that would make sense because it would correspond with Anne being described as having, you know, a goodly belly in July 1534. It's about that pregnancy. It's not about an extra pregnancy in 1535. But Anne was definitely pregnant again in January 1536. For on the 29th of January 1536, the same day that her predecessor, Catherine of Aragon, was buried at Peterborough and was recorded as miscarrying a male child which she had not born three and a half months. So Anne Boleyn had one live birth, Elizabeth I, a definite, um, a definite early miscarriage in 1536 and then either a premature stillbirth or a phantom pregnancy in 1534. So three pregnancies that we have evidence for. So not a whole series of miscarriages and stillbirths at all. Now novels and movies like The Other Berlin Girl have popularized the idea that there was something strange about Anne Boleyn's miscarriage in January 1536 that she miscarried a deformed fetus. This is completely untrue. Um, it is a complete myth. We have four main pieces of contemporary evidence for Anne's miscarriage. We have Edward Hall's Chronicle. We have Charles Risley's Chronicle. We have a dispatch written by Eustace Chapuis, the Imperial Ambassador. And we have a poem written by Lancelot de Carle 
who was secretary to the French ambassador at the time in England. None of them suggested that there was anything unusual about this miscarriage. It was a simple miscarriage, tragic as it was. There was nothing unusual about it. Edward Hall states that Anne brought a bed of a child before her time, which was born dead. Risley states that the that Queen Anne was brought to bed and delivered of a man-child, as it was said, before her time, for she said that she had reckoned herself at that time but 15 weeks gone with child. Chapuis states that she lost a male child, which she had not borne three and a half months. And De Carl writes that Anne prematurely gave birth to a beautiful boy whose stillbirth led to many tears. So those are contemporary sources. They were all written in 1536. They don't say anything about there being something unusual. So where does this idea of a deformed fetus um, come from? Is it purely fictional? Well, we have to thank the man that I've already mentioned, uh, Catholic recusant Nicholas Sander, who um, it was known um, in the 17th century as Dr. Slander. We have him to thank um, for this idea as well as the extra finger story. Um, in 1585, he wrote that Anne brought forth only a shapeless mass of flesh. Now, a shapeless, a shapeless mass of flesh isn't exactly a deformed fetus, is it? But it can be kind of twisted into one. Um, and again, I'd like to point out that Sander was writing in the 1580s in Elizabeth I's reign, whereas the other accounts that I've mentioned of Anne Boleyn's miscarriage were all written in 1536, the year that the miscarriage took place. Of course, the idea that Anne miscarried a deformed fetus has been used in fiction to back up the idea that Anne committed incest with her brother George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, and that she then got pregnant and, you know, this baby was the spawn of the devil. It was of their incest. Um, Anne and George were accused of incest at their trials in 1536 and found guilty, but it doesn't mean that they actually did it. Um, there were no rumours about the two of them having an unhealthy or strange um, relationship with each other before Anne's fall in 1536. You know, nothing was said about them being unhealthily close or, you know, anything untoward about them. There is no suggest suggestion of a weird relationship before Anne's fall in May 1536. And contrary to myth, George's wife, Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, did not accuse them of incest or give evidence at their trials. Eustace Chapuis, that imperial ambassador whose dispatches tell us so much information about Anne's fall in 1536, stated that no proof of George's guilt was produced except that of his having once passed many hours in her company and other little follies. So George and Anne were close. They had a shared faith. And George commissioned beautiful um, illuminated manuscripts of religious works for his sister, knowing that she'd appreciate them, complete with a loving dedication. But there was nothing at all icky in it. And, you know, Chapuis says that the only evidence produced was of George having been with Anne alone in her company for a few hours. That was the only evidence of them having committed incest. Now, I know some people point out that there was this huge pressure on Anne um, after, you know, Catherine of Aragon had had her failed pregnancies. There was this huge pressure on Anne to produce a son. And if Henry VIII was having some problems in the bedroom department, which we know he was because 
of um, a note that George Boleyn was passed at his trial in 1536, um, which um, said that he, Anne and Jane Boleyn had um, discussed um, Henry VIII's problems in the bedroom. Um, we have this idea from some people that then this pressure on Anne to produce a male heir would have led to her naturally, of course, turning to her brother for help. But really, how is that at all natural? How does that make sense? Um, now, I'm, I'm going to share something personal here. Um, I'm sure Tim won't mind me sharing this, but we had, um, with our daughter, we, we had IVF treatment. Um, and, you know, IVF costs money. And at no point did I think, oh, okay, I'd really, no, I don't think we'll pay for IVF. Ah, oh, my brother, yes. I can sleep with my brother to have um, have another child. At no point did that enter my head. And at no point would that have entered Anne's head, would it? How is that natural to think of your brother as, as being a possible father for your baby? So, no. And how does it make sense if Henry VIII can't do the deed? If Henry VIII is having problems, then he'd obviously know that he wasn't the father of Anne's child if she got pregnant. So how does that make any sense whatsoever? I'm sorry, that's just complete garbage. Um, Anne and George were both people of a strong personal faith. They knew their Bible. They believed in the authority of scripture. They may not have been angels. They were multifaceted people, like all people with, you know, good parts, bad parts. They weren't angels. But incest would have been seen by them as something that was evil and a monstrous idea. So the charge of incest in 1536 was a way of completely blackening the Boleyn's reputation, the Boleyn's name and reputation. There is no evidence that there was anything at all icky about um, Anne and George's relationship. So there you go, put that one to bed as well. Our next myth, I'm guessing through these myths, our next myth is the idea that Anne changed the family name, that she changed it from the common Bullen to Berlin, um, that this was an attempt to Frenchify it, um, to make it more sophisticated. Well, this is complete bull. Do you like what I did there? Um, there was actually no standardised spelling at the time. So that's why we have so many different um, spellings of Berlin in the contemporary documents. I'm going to add a slide here. In his research of records going back to the 13th century, Reverend Canon Parsons, who wrote a journal article called Some Notes on the Berlin Family, found the name spelt variously. And you can see some of the spellings there. Um, all Berlin, but all um, very, very different. And he concluded um, that Berlin, B-O-L-E-Y-N, was the most common of the medieval forms. And I'm actually going to show you two photos now. This photo is from the beautiful, incredibly, oh, it's just so detailed, it is magnificent, uh, Thomas Berlin's Brass Memorial, on his tomb at St. Peter's Church, Hever, which is just outside Hever Castle on the green. Well worth seeing. Um, which, if you can see that slide, it says, here lies Thomas Bullen. Um, v and a V and U, they were interchangeable then. So you've got B-U-L-L-E-N. Okay, so that's from Thomas Bullen's Brass Memorial. The next slide, this is hard to see because of the light shining on it. 
but that is from a little um, brass cross memorial um, in the very same church. Um, and it marks, it's in memory of Henry Bull Bullen, Bullen, um, Thomas Boleyn's uh, son who died in infancy. And it's actually spelt Boleyn, B-U-L-L-A-Y-E-N. So that's in the same church um, and the, the same family that we have two different spellings. Um, and that's because there were just was no standardized spelling. That's just the way things were. It's like when I'm reading contemporary documents and I, I have to have a chuckle and quite often show, show Tim because the writer of these letters and dispatches and that, or chronicles can't even make up their mind how to spell the same word in the same line or paragraph. Um, I can see in the same paragraph, king spelt K-I-N-G, K-Y-N-G-E, K-I-N-G-E, and so on. And it's just, it's so funny. But there just wasn't any standardized spelling at all. Anne Boleyn tended to use Boleyn, B-O-L-E-Y-N, but it certainly wasn't an effort to change the name from Boleyn and to make it more um, posh by, by spelling it um, B-O-L-E-Y-N, Boleyn. She did not change the name. It, it's just a matter of spelling and there actually being no standardized spelling at the time. So there you go. That's another one got rid of. Our next myth is the idea that Anne Boleyn was a flirt who took the, the courtly love convention too far, that she was a flirty queen. Well, that's complete rubbish. I'd highly recommend, by the way, historian Sarah Griswood's latest book, um, The Tudors in Love, The Courtly Code Behind the Last Medieval Dynasty, for anyone that's interested in reading more about the courtly love convention. It's an excellent explanation of courtly love. To explain very, very briefly, courtly love was a chivalric tradition which was centuries old before the Tudors came to the throne. Knights would woo ladies, and these were often ladies who were above them in station, in class, and ladies who were actually married. Now, Anne Boleyn was queen, and the male courtiers surrounding her were expected to woo her and flirt with her because she, she was the queen of courtly love. She was the queen of the court and they were the knights. So they were meant to flatter her. That was kind of their job. Um, so when we come to Anne Boleyn's fall in 1536, there is absolutely nothing inappropriate or unusual about the behaviour of men like court musician Mark Smeaton um, and courtiers Francis Weston or Henry Norris, Henry Norris being um, Henry VIII's groom of the stool. They, they were supposed to pretend that they were in love with Queen Anne Boleyn. They were supposed to flatter her and flirt with her. And Anne was supposed to be pleased with that and to respond positively. It was all part of the courtly love convention. It was chivalric. There was nothing dark or untoward in it at all. Now, I interviewed Sarah Griswood recently for a video which um, is going on the Tudor Society early next year. And I asked her about the rules for courtly love. This is a convention that fascinates me. And she spoke about in the 12th century about how one writer went as far as saying that a knight and um, his lady uh, could be naked in bed together. And this, that could be still seen as pure love as long as they actually didn't do the deed. I found that completely fascinating, fascinating and even more so when we think about Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and their 
six or seven years of, of courtship and you know them holding out um, for marriage. But Henry VIII also in his letters writing of wanting to kiss Anne Boleyn's duckies, her breasts, um, it, it sort of makes you think that they, you know, they could go so far and just uh, not do the deed and it was still seen as sort of pure. As for, um, so let's go back to Anne Boleyn. So there was Francis Weston and Henry Norris and Mark Smeaton all sort of um, making sort of romantic overtures to, to the Queen, sort of flirting with her and, and um, you know, Norris um, sort of saying that, you know, he was he wasn't rushing into marriage with with Mad Shelton, um, you know, because of course it was, you know, no nobody was as good as the Queen and all, all that flattery and flirting, that was all courtly love. But obviously it could be twisted into something else at Anne's fall. It was used to back up, you know, the idea that Anne Boleyn was actually um committing adultery with these men that there was nothing unusual about it. As for Anne being an unsuitable queen, being a bad queen, you know, she hadn't been brought up to be queen, um, but during her short tenure as queen, obviously it was very short, th three years, she was a good queen. She met the norms of the time. She embraced the role of mediator and intercessor. She interceded when she believed that the money taken from the monasteries during the dissolution of monasteries was going into the royal coffers rather than being spent on charitable and educational um, projects. And she stepped in to help evangelical reformers who were in trouble, for example, Nicholas Bourbon, who was imprisoned in France. She stepped in, interceded, and he ended up tutoring her nephew, Henry Carey, and also Henry Norris's son. Um, she stepped in to intercede for merchant Richard Hillman, who'd been imprisoned under Cardinal Wolsey. And she also interceded for a prior who was in trouble for buying books from a, um, a bookseller who was dealing in heresy, heretical books. She also helped petitioners who wanted grants, lands or titles. So she was a mediator and intercessor. And that was one of the roles of a good medieval queen. Anne Boleyn also acted as a patron. She uh, helped raise evangelical men by offering them places in her household. She supported the dissemination of the Bible in English. And she was also a patron to scholars. She had uh, works dedicated to her. And Hans Holbein the Younger, that amazing uh, Tudor artist, also viewed her as a patron and she commissioned work from him. Then she also used her position as queen to promote poor relief. Um, she gave vast sums uh, to the poor. She ordered her ladies to make shirts, smocks and sheets for the poor. And she ordered her chaplains to always be on the lookout for people in need and to, to give them what they needed or to let her know about those people in need so that she could help them. So Anne was a model medieval queen. Her only failure was in not being able to provide the king with a son and heir. You know, Elizabeth was a girl. And although we know with hindsight that that girl would become one of you know, England's greatest monarchs, um, Henry VIII didn't appreciate that. Um, so her, fail her only failure in being the model medieval queen was in not providing a son and heir. But she didn't exactly get much chance to do that, did she, with a three-year marriage? The final myth that I'm going to handle today, I think this is the final one, is the idea that Anne Boleyn was charged with witchcraft. Um, 
this is a common fallacy. I come across it all the time. I've lost count, actually, of the times that I've that I've seen this one. Um, you know, people are always talking about how witchcraft appears as one of the charges laid against Anne, but it actually doesn't appear in the charges listed. We have the indictments of the grand juries of Kent and Middlesex, and they do not list witchcraft at all. Anne was charged with high treason for conspiring to kill the king with her alleged lovers, who incl included four courtiers, um, Henry Norris, Francis Weston, Mark Smeaton and William Brereton, and her brother, George Boleyn, Lord Rochford. So, of course, that was incest. Now, this witchcraft idea has been popularised in fiction. Um, Philippa Gregory's The Other Boleyn Girl depicts Anne as sort of dabbling in witchcraft, um, taking a potion to bring on the miscarriage of a baby, and also having a witch taker help to bring Anne down in 1536. That's a work of fiction, but even some non-fiction writers have featured witchcraft and being linked to Anne Boleyn in their books. Now, Nora Lofts, she wrote fiction about Anne, but she also wrote a non-fiction book about Anne. And in her non-fiction book, she describes Anne as having a mole known as the devil's poor mark and of having made the typical witch's threat when she was in the tower, claiming that there'd be no rain in England for seven years. And Lofts goes on to explain that seven was the magic number and that witches were thought to control the weather. That Anne was just... Anne was in a complete state when she was taken to the Tower of London. She was rambling. She was hysterical. She was she was going during during her imprisonment. She was going from being very rational uh, to very upset to almost hysterical at times. And, and and can you blame her? And Lofts also states to back up this idea of Anne Boleyn, um, you know, being a witch that Anne had a dog named Urian, which um, is a name for Satan, and that Anne also managed to cast a spell on Henry, which eventually ran out in 1536, hence his violent reaction. Lofts writes, the passing from adoration to hatred. So this spell that Anne had put on Henry ran out in 1536, and that's why she fell. But the funniest bit of um, Lofts' book for me is when Lofts, Lofts describes her visit to Saul Church um, in Norfolk, where, according to legend, Anne's body was really buried. And Lofts met the sexton of the church, and he told her that he'd decided to keep vigil one 19th of May anniversary of Anne's execution to see if Anne's ghost appeared. Now he didn't see Anne's ghost but what he did see was a huge hair um, jumping around the church before it just vanished into thin air and according to Nora Lofts a hair was one of the shapes that a witch was supposed to be able to take at will and so she wonders if it had actually been Anne that had appeared to the sexton. No, nope, I think it was just a hair, don't you? That's bizarre. Oh, and by the way, going back to the dog, Uriah and the dog, you know, the name of Satan. Anne didn't have a dog named Uriah, and that's another myth we can get rid of. It's often said that Anne had a greyhound who was called Uriah and that it was given to her by Urian Brereton, um, brother of William Brereton, one of the men who was executed in May 1536. That's William Brereton, not Urian Brereton. I found no evidence of Anne having a greyhound called Urian or Urian Brereton giving her a greyhound. But in Henry VIII's Privy Purse Expenses, there is record of a farmer being paid 10 shillings for a cow which had been killed by two greyhounds, one belonging to Uriah Brereton 
and the other belonging to Anne. It states, item, the same day paid for a cow that Urian, a, Brereton Grey, a Brereton's greyhound, and my lady Anne's killed 10 shillings, 25th of September, 1530. Now, although this could be read as one of the greyhounds being called Urian, but belonging to the Brereton's, that would be misinterpreting it. There were definitely two dogs involved in this attack on the cow. Um, and I'm not sure that Uri Urian Brereton or William Brereton would have called their dog Urian. It's more likely that Urian, a Brereton's greyhound, means Urian Brereton's greyhound, and that it was his greyhound and another one belonging to Anne Boleyn that killed the cow. It is just a misinterpretation of that privy purse expense. Now, another historian who mentions witchcraft in relation to Anne Boleyn is Rita Warnick, who writes that the licentious charges against the Queen, even if the rumours of her attempted poisonings and of her causing her husband's impotence were never introduced into any of the any of the trials, indicate that Henry believed that she was a witch. But there's nothing to suggest that King Henry VIII did believe that Anne Boleyn was a witch. He may well have been reported as saying that he'd been forced into this second marriage by sortilege and charms. But that, to me, reads more like him saying that, you know, Anne bewitched him, as in he completely fell under her spell. And I'm saying that meaning in a non-witchy way. She didn't actually cast a spell on him. He fell for her charms, and I'm not using charms in a witchy way as well. You know, he just fell completely in love with her, and that he's not seriously accusing her of being a witch. Although witchcraft wasn't a crime punishable by death um, in 1536, it still could have been used to bolster the other charges and to blacken Anne's name. But it's not mentioned in any of the indictments and there's no mention of it um, during Anne's trial either. So we can definitely put the idea that she was charged with witchcraft to bed. So, um, yes. And actually, let's do another myth, shall we? We've got time. So let's talk about the myths regarding Anne's burial and her resting place. Now, as you know, traitors' heads were often put on pikes or spikes on London Bridge to show the citizens of London the price of treachery. Um, but Anne's head was definitely not placed on one of these pikes and displayed. It was definitely buried with her body. We know this because of the contemporary sources Chronicler Charles Risley records that her body with the head was buried in the chapel within the Tower of London in the choir there the same day at afternoon. An account of her execution in the Vienna archive states, immediately the executioner did his office and when her head was off, it was taken by a young lady and covered with a white cloth. Afterwards, the body was taken by the other ladies and the whole carried into the church nearest to the Tower of London. And in his poem, Lancelot Carl, that secretary to the French ambassador, writes, the head and body were taken by the maids who almost looked deprived of their own souls for their dejection and extreme weakness, that fearing that their mistress would be held and touched by the undeserving hands of heartless men, they offered themselves to this task too and carried the dead body, nearly dead themselves, wrapped in a white blanket toward the place of her sad burial inside the tower where she'd been held prisoner, which would also be her last abode. And finally, Hollingshed's Chronicle states, her body with the head was buried in the choir of the chapel in the tower. The chapel being the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula, which is within the confines of the Tower of London. 
Agnes Strickland in the Victorian period wrote of a legend concerning Anne Boleyn's remains being moved from the chapel. She wrote that Anne was secretly removed from the Tower Church under the cover of darkness and privately conveyed to Saul Church, the ancient burial place of the Boleyns. And there the body was interred at midnight with the holy rites that were denied to her by her royal husband at her first unhallowed funeral. However, Strickland does state that this is legend and there's certainly no evidence of Anne being moved or of another legend, her heart being buried at St. Mary's Church in Erwerton, Suffolk. That is another legend. There's no evidence to back that idea up. And as I said um, in my talk the other day, um, the Victorian team who exhumed the remains in the chancel of St. Peter ad Vincula in 1876 found the remains of a female where it was recorded that Anne Boleyn was buried. But legends are great, aren't they? I do, do love uh, legends. So I got through quite a few of the common myths there. And I know I haven't got through all of the myths that surround um, this fascinating lady, but uh, I've done quite a few and I hope that this information has helped you. Now, before I move on to questions, I just want to draw your attention to um, an event that I am doing. Um, I'm running an online conference, Anne Boleyn, the woman who changed England in the spring from the 28th of February to the 6th of March, 2022, completely online, so open internationally. Um, in focusing on Anne Boleyn's early life, I and seven other Boleyn experts are going to reveal to you just what made Anne Boleyn, um, the woman who made Henry VIII change the course of English history. And it will definitely uh, offer you more insights into Anne and what made her tick. These uh, are the experts, eight Boleyn experts, seven days of talks and live Q&A sessions with these experts and all completely online. So we've got Owen Emerson, who many of you will know from uh, Heaver Castle and his colleague, Kate McCaffrey, Natalie Grinninger, who you'll know from On the Tudor Trail and her Talking Tudors podcast, Gareth Russell, you can just see him behind my logo there, who, of course, um, he was on um, the Boleyn's Scandalous Family with Owen, with Lauren Mackay uh, and with Estelle Peronk, um, Sarah Morris from the Tudor Travel Guide, and of course, me. So we've got those eight Berlin experts and a week long uh, week of goodies, really, uh, talks and live Q&A sessions so that you can talk to these historians and get your questions answered. And we're hoping that you will find out why Anne was far from the social climber that fiction often makes her out to be by delving into her ancestry and family background that you'll discover the true Anne Boleyn who arrived at the English court in 1522 and turned the heads of a courtier, that's Henry Percy, poet, Thomas Wyatt, and the King of England. And that by looking at her early life, that you'll understand just what made this maid of honour so very different from those around her, what made her tick, and how she was a true Renaissance woman. So tickets are available now at my author website, claireridgeway.com. You'll see it on the homepage. There is a link on the homepage for this event, Anne Boleyn, The Woman Who Changed England. Um, so I'm really, really, really excited um, about this conference. Um, it will be wonderful. So excited to be working with these other historians. Okay, now to your questions. And it is helpful if you put a cue in front of your question so that I can see it more easily. And sorry that I'm not going to be able to look at all your questions and answer all of your questions. It's just impossible 
when there are so many. Let's have a look. We've got Louise. Anne was a cosmopolitan woman. The court of Henry VIII wasn't ready for her. She transcended them. Yeah, I very, I very much agree with you. She was a true Renaissance woman coming um, back from, you know, the Renaissance court of uh, France. Uh, very, very different uh, kind of woman. I don't think anyone was ready for her. Um, Rebecca Monet. Amen. Thank you. I'm not sure whether that's in response to what I said about those wonderful historians, but I know that Rebecca knows um, a lot of those historians very well. So um, thank you. And let's have a look for some questions. Chris is saying, tell us about your headband. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm all... I'm pretty fired because, uh, yeah, I went out for a Christmas lunch. Um, and this was actually, I had this done ages ago um, by um, Daniela Baker, who used to make replica um, replica jewellery from the Tudors series. And it was actually, this is a replica of what Natalie Dormer wore in the Tudors series. And I love getting out at Christmas and uh just uh yes wearing wearing something from the Tudors series I did love the jewelry in that series um let's have a look Kitty do we know what are the favorite foods of Henry's wives no we don't know their favorite foods um we know that Jane Seymour was partial to quails and I think also quails eggs um when she was pregnant with Edward um so she she had a craving for those uh and was said to have had a craving she came out and said she had a craving for apples when she was pregnant with elizabeth the first but we don't really know anything about their you know their favorite things um so sorry about that uh dorothy has anyone ever suggested a big reason henry was so brutal to Anne was he was afraid she was laughing at him there was this idea that um, that came up at the trials as well, that um, Anne and her brother had been ridiculing um, Henry. You know, they'd been joking at his expense, sort of writing ballads at his expense, ridiculing him. They were very intellectual um, people. Um, so perhaps, yeah, perhaps Henry did feel some kind of inferiority i mean henry was a very intelligent man he he was seen as a true renaissance prince when he came to the throne there was a lot of hope for him he was highly intelligent interested in literature and theology i can imagine him having very interesting discussions with anne but yes perhaps perhaps he did feel that um perhaps he 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 felt very betrayed by Anne that she had ridiculed him. Um, she obviously hadn't been able to give him a son either. Margaret, did Anne know of any of these myths? Well, she obviously at her trial was made aware that she was being accused of incest and um, adultery. So, yes, she was aware of that and that must have been absolutely awful for her especially the charge of incest and i know that in the tower she was consumed with worry for the others who were in the tower who had been linked to her and what was going to happen to them i always find it so tragic when you read of anne's worry for others and also when you read that sir william kingston who was constable of the tower at the time was really, really worried about George Boleyn's state of mind and the fact that he was consumed with worry for those who owed him money and for those he owed money to. He was worried that his death would mean that the king would um, take on that responsibility and that those people would not be paid, the people he owed money to would not be paid and that those who owed money to George would the, the king would pressurize them for for payments and he just spent his conscience was just he was distraught and so william kingston kept writing to cromwell saying what can i do you know to ease um lord rochford's conscience and worries so george 
wasn't worried for himself. He was worried about those people that were being sort of left behind. And that always um, makes me very emotional, um, you know, thinking about that. Let's look through questions. Shelley, what kind of relationship did Anne have with her sister? We actually don't know much about their relationship at all. They obviously both went to France to serve Mary Tudor. Um, Mary Boleyn was also with Anne at times um, while she was, um, was queen. Um, and then Mary seems to have disappeared and then came back to court in 1534, September 1534, pregnant um, to tell Anne that she'd secretly married William Stafford. And there was this huge falling out because Mary was meant to, even as a widow, widows normally had sort of um, a bit more freedom, but Mary was the queen's sister. So it was expected that someone of her station linked to um, the king and queen would have sought their help in arranging a marriage. And she went her own way. Um, and the family, the Boleyns and Anne, were furious with her and she was banished from court. So there was a real division there. But, um, yeah, we don't know anything about their personal relationship, um, how they felt about each other, that they certainly weren't close after that banishment um, and Mary wrote quite a sort of strong letter to Cromwell asking him to intercede for her and saying that she really preferred to be, um, this is really paraphrasing the letter, she preferred to be begging, you know, married to a poor man for love rather than to being the Queen of England and having everything. Um, so, yes, so a breakdown in the relationship there. Let's have a look what else we've got. Fabio, what historically accurate books do you recommend to someone who wants to learn about Tudor and Stuart female monarchs? So Lady Jane Grey, Queen Jane as I like to call her, I would recommend the books by Leander Delisle, The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, which is about the Grey Sisters. And I would recommend Eric Ives' book on, on Lady Jane Grey as well, A Tudor Mystery, I think it's called. Mary the First, I would recommend um, Linda Porter's book on her. I very much enjoyed that, and Anna Whitelock's book as well. Elizabeth the First, oh, what would I recommend? I like Sarah Griswood's book about Elizabeth and Leicester. Um, I like Anne Somerset's book. I like Alison Plowden's book. And I love David Starkey's book on sort of Elizabeth's sort of early years and her early reign as well. Mary Queen of Scots, my very favourite book on Mary Queen of Scots is John Guy's book, My Heart is My Own. That is a fabulous book and Antonia Fraser's book is very good as well. So there you go, there's some book recommendations for you. Kristen is asking what has been documented about how Elizabeth felt um, about her father having killed her mother. I, I haven't come across anything, I can't think of anything offhand that talks about how Elizabeth felt about it. I mean, Elizabeth talked um, about, um, she seems to have taken pride in being Henry VIII's daughter and being the lion's cub, but then she also didn't hide from her mother's memory either. She used her mother's falcon badge. She supported you know, treatises being written about her mother. Portraits of Anne were painted during her reign um it is um i think it's in lauren mckay's um biography i think it was in her biography of thomas Boleyn about um when elizabeth the first visited as queen visited norwich um she asked for her her chair her throne to be moved so that it was facing um the kind of the Boleyn chapel there the tombs of her ancestors she certainly didn't shy away from her Berlin heritage. It, I just don't know how she must have felt about what happened and what she'd been told about the events of 1536. So, uh, yes, 
awful. Chloe, do you ever read and enjoy Tudor fiction books? If so, which ones? I do. Yeah, I, I do. I really, really enjoy historical novels because I love literature and I love the Tudors. <laughs> I love history. So, so I do. And I much prefer them when it's so obvious that they're novels and they're not pretending to be anything else. I mean, I've read Jean Plady. I've read Robin Maxwell. Um, Wendy Dunn, I love hers. Adrian Dillard's, I love. I love C.J. Sampson's um, Shard Lake uh, series. I mean, you know, sort of the whodunits um, that are, you know, from Henry VIII's reign. I love Tony Mount's Medieval Mysteries with Seb Foxley. I'm trying to think which ones. I've got so many. I've got a bookcase that I actually dedicate to my sort of historical novels. C.W. Gaunt. I'm going to feel really guilty now that I've I've missed people um but yes I really really do love them and yeah I, I I love ones from different periods as well I mean I'm a huge Outlander fan um both the series and the books I have just finished the latest book uh you know go what is it go to hell the bees that I'm gone um and, and now I feel just distraught, grief stricken that I finished it. I feel very empty. So, yes, a big Outlander fan. So, I really do enjoy historical fiction. Um, talking about historical fiction, Devon asks What fiction represents the relationship between Anne and Henry most accurately? Oh, that's such a hard one. Oh, I don't know. I mean, Natalia Richards' books I love. Um, Falcons Rise, Falcons Flight. Sandra Vasoli's books. Um, I would say, yeah, I think Sandra's books, Sandra Vasoli's books, um, Struck with the Dart of Love, and I can't remember the, the other one. But that those those two the, the titles flown straight out of my head but Sandra Vasoli's um novels her Anne Boleyn novels I really like the the dynamics of the relationship between the two of them um so yes I think perhaps I'd have to go go for that and Chloe's actually asking if I'd ever write a Tudor fiction novel myself my first love in writing actually is writing fiction I spent my childhood and my teens writing um, fiction, and now I'm a non-fiction author, which is quite funny. Um, <clears throat> I have actually um, started writing a, a young adult's novel, um, yes, about set in Tudor times, but I just keep putting it to one side and doing other things. So perhaps one day I will... Um, yeah, perhaps one day I will actually get to and finish it. Talia is asking, will you do a video on your bookshelf? I actually, I've done quite a few. Um, for the Tudor Society, I quite often do videos. We always have a sort of a Friday event, either me doing a live or um, or sort of um, videos from historians. And as, as some of as part of that, I've done quite a few um, videos on my bookshelf. Perhaps I ought to do one for my YouTube channel as well, where I've looked at, um, because I've, I've got huge, I've got bookcase on historical novels, and then I've got even bigger uh, bookcase, um, which I have compartmentalized into um, different sort of Tudor personalities. You know, Henry VIII's got his own section, Anne Boleyn's got a section, um, the other six wives, Elizabeth the first, they've all got sections. I've got a Tudor life section, a Tudor art section. So yeah, I, I want to do that for YouTube sometime. So uh, thank you for that idea. Ah, yes, Tim's saying truth endures. Um, thank you, Tim. Sandra Fasoli's other book is Truth in Jaws. Yes, that completely went straight out of my head. Mr. Squidge, what was Anne's relationship like with her mother? Do we know? We never hear about her, and in some works of fiction, she's never even mentioned. Yeah, well, we know that Anne was very worried about her mother's health. Um, when Anne was taken to the tower after her arrest, she, she was very, very worried about her mother. And in fact, um, Elizabeth Boleyn had been um, 
mentioned again i think it's in the loyal letters about being um sorely uh, diseased with with a cough um so whether it was the start of something like tuberculosis you know consumption um we just don't know but um yes anne was very worried about her mother um and we know that elizabeth boleyn acted as chaperone during um Henry and Anne's courtship. Um, we know, for example, that when York Place was taken uh, from Cardinal Wolsey um, by King Henry VIII, that when he and Anne visited it to do sort of an inventory of it and to look at it, this is York Place that became, um, they changed their name to Whitehall. They sort of renovated it, did building work on it, made changes to it. We know that when they visited it, that Elizabeth went with them. So she acted as a chaperone um, during the courtship. So I would have said that it was a very, very close um, relationship, her mother being there at key times. So, oh, yes, Rebecca's saying that uh, she loves Natalia Richards and Sandra Vasoli's books too. Yeah, and I love, um, yeah, Adrian Dillard's um, book, for people that are interested in Jane Boleyn, um, Adrian does her real justice in her book, um, The Raven's Widow. That one came into my head. Um, that's a novel. Um, I know nobody's asked this, but if, if you want to know more about Jane Boleyn, that as a novel, I think, is a wonderful book. Charlie Fenton's um, new book on Jane Boleyn and also Julia Fox's um, biography of Jane Boleyn, I'd recommend for those of you that want to uh, get behind the myths that surround Jane Boleyn. She's been very badly maligned by history. Shelley's asking, what reading got you into this period initially? For me, it was, um, I think that's Jean Plady. Yeah, I, yeah. Jean, Jean Plady, I've got her whole series of historical novels. Um, so, yes, I can completely agree with you that, uh, yeah, she she is. Yeah, I, and Philippa Gregory as well. I mean, the other Berlin girl, her, you know, that, that sort of drew me to Anne's story and wanting to find out the truth behind it. And is it The Virgin's Love? Did she write that one as well? And Robin Maxwell's books. Yeah, they the good thing about historical fiction is it draws you in and you want to know the truth behind it. Um so so yes, all sorts of authors have brought me into it. Chase, Miss Claire, would you please answer this? How much did when King Henry split from the Catholic religion, how much of impact did this have on the correct translation of the word of God in 16? There were so many um, translations of of the Bible at this time. I mean, we've got William Tyndall's edition of it. We've we've got all the editions, you know. After that, was it the Matthew Bible? And you've obviously got the King James edition. There was there was this real with, with the Reformation. There was the idea of the authority of Scripture, and therefore Scripture um, being hugely important that you were actually reading it correctly so so the reformation made the yeah just dis, this dissemination of the bible more important and the bible in english um would i hold king henry the eighth breaking with the church responsible for correct translation i'm not i'm not sure that that can be said and Obviously, the Bible has been through all kinds of, um, you know, translations since then. So I'm not sure I, I've got the expertise to answer that. Um, but obviously, there was a support of the Bible being, you know, made available in English. And so it going through these different sort of periods of translation. Uh, let's have a look what else have we got. Um, comments are just loading. Let's have a look. 
Oh, thank you. I appreciate all your hard work and I love your channel and emails. Oh, thank you. Oh, there's some, some, oh, thank you. Oh, there's so many comments, so many beautiful comments. Chloe, you're the first Tudor historian I've ever encountered and you're responsible for growing my love of Anne. Who or what started you off your love of Anne and the Tudors? It was actually from a really early age I had to do when I was in my final year of primary school. So I was 11. I had to do... Um, I had to do a project on Henry VIII and his six wives. And it was just, I just couldn't believe that this man had had six wives and that he'd executed two of them, such larger than life characters. And, and so that really drew me to Tudor history. I'd also encountered it um, when I was at infant school when I was, I must have been about six, when we did, um, I think I played a lady in waiting to Elizabeth I. And we and we did this huge thing on Elizabeth, and I remember being very drawn to Elizabeth at the time. And and then I I very much enjoyed history at secondary school. Um, yeah, I did history O level and A level, and I was lucky enough at A level to um, do um, we our history was split into European history and um, British history, and. I did the Tudors and Stuarts and absolutely loved the Tudors. And we also did, in the European element, we did the European Reformation. I was very, very drawn to um, the Reformation um, and how that linked with the Tudors. And then at university, I actually studied um, religion as my major at university. So I studied, um, you know, the history of Christianity. So I kept coming across the Reformation and, and sort of the Tudor link um, there. And so it was, it was kind of the the yeah the religious aspect of it, and then Anne Anne Boleyn's link with with that, and then just a love of historical novels uh, throughout um, adulthood, and loving you know the movies. And and I have to admit. Uh, my uh yes I loved my sin of loving the Tudors series as well and how that kind of brought the 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 Tudor court to life so many inaccuracies but I just felt it did such a good job at bringing the Tudor courts to life and bringing people into Tudor history as well lots of things started off my love and but thank you that um it's lovely to know that my work <coughs> does help people to grow in loving Tudor history and growing in knowledge as well. So um, there are all kinds of uh, questions and comments here. Valentine, after Anne's father went into exile, where did he go? How long did he live on? What did he do to make a living? He didn't go into exile. He did retreat from court uh, to grieve, but he was back at court quite quickly. Um, we have he was active in putting down the pilgrimage of grace rebellion um in raising men for that so that was in the autumn of 1536 so only a few months after his children had been executed he as i said yesterday i think it was yesterday he had to prove himself prove his loyalty to the king his career his job was serving the king um he couldn't get out of that however he felt about things how long did he live on? Well, Elizabeth Boleyn died in April 1538 and Thomas Boleyn died in March 1539, so less than three years after Anne's execution. What did he do to make a living? He carried on serving the king. That was his job. That was his only job was serving the king. Um, being a courtier, that's what his role was. So there was no getting around that. But yes, I do feel, you know, both both Anne's parents died, you know, within just a few years of their children's executions. I think that must really have affected their health. I'm so sorry if I'm not getting through all your questions. There are so many, but I really, really do appreciate them and you're very, very kind. Um very, very kind um comments. Um let's have a look through. Catherine, is there any part of the Tudor period that you wish more TV shows and movies, et cetera, would focus on? 
Ooh. I'd actually really like a documentary or a movie sort of based on the events of July 1553 with, you know, you have Edward VI failing health and obviously then him dying, Lady Jane Grey becoming queen. And then you have these two real tough cookies, if I can call them that, um, Queen Jane and Princess Mary. Um, you, you have this battle for the throne. And once Lady Jane Grey believed that it was her destiny to be queen, um, that she'd been chosen, Edward VI had chosen her, and that it was she believed that it was her destiny that God had put her in that role. She fought for it. She was writing letters, raising troops and making people loyal to her, while Princess Mary was raising troops in East Anglia and writing to the Privy Council um, saying that they should accept her as queen. You've got these two really strong women and I just love to see something more on those events and you know Mary's rise to the throne Jane you know imprisoned in the tower and also perhaps a, a, something more on Mary the first rather you know we ha we just see her as bloody Mary but uh, like all of these um Tudor personalities there was so much more to her than than that. So much more to her reign. Um, she there were achievements. She achieved a lot in her reign. So I'd I'd love that. Yeah, that to be fleshed out more, either in a show, um, a docudrama, or a fictional kind of retelling. Um, yeah, I think I'd have to pick pick that. So let's have a look. Mayful. How many ladies were with Queen Anne during her imprisonment? Off the top of my head, I can't remember how many there were, but they were specifically chosen. There was Mrs. Coffin, uh, Lady Kingston, who was Sir William Kingston's um, wife, um, Anne's aunt, um, Lady Boleyn, was with her, Lady Shelton. Though I can't remember how many women were with her. And I probably got that just completely wrong. I haven't got my book to to hand where I name them. Um, but they were all chosen. They weren't Anne's normal ladies. They were all chosen specifically to act as spies. And they were told that um, they shouldn't converse with Anne unless Lady Kingston, um, Sir William Kingston's wife, um, was present and then it was her job to feed back to Sir William Kingston, Constable of the Tower, what Anne had said so that he could record it in his daily dispatches to Thomas Cromwell. And Sir William Kingston also dined with Anne each day so he could also tell Cromwell what he was hearing um, from Anne. So I can't remember offhand uh, because it is rather late at night here, um, how many ladies she had with her or uh, their names, that's gone completely out of my head, but they weren't her normal ladies, they were, and Anne complained about the ladies who weren't sympathetic to her, that the king had, you know, and King and Cromwell had chosen women that were not sympathetic to her. Tara, I know you collect Tudor related objects, do you have a favourite or one that's special to you? Um, my dear friend Dawn Hatswell has sent me, um, the, the Peggy Nisbet, um, dolls of, um, Henry VIII's six wives and, um, also the, um, Tudor queens. Um, I absolutely love those. Um, I have a replica bee necklace, which means a lot to me because obviously of my, my, my fascination with Anne Boleyn. Um, the medal that I showed um, in the other day's talk, um, the replica of the 1534 Anne Boleyn medal that Lucy Churchill has so beautifully done. Oh, what other Tudor related objects? I'm a real collector as well of um, sort of engravings 
um, of the of the Tudors, a sort of Victorian engravings. Um, so I love those. Oh, so many. Well, it's really hard to pick a favourite. Um, oh, and I do love the gifts that I got from a certain person, Tara. Um, my bee, my bee earrings and matching bee ring, which are done like the bee pendant on Anne Boleyn's um, necklace. I absolutely love those from the historic royal palaces shops at um, Hampton Court and the Tower of London. And um, those, I've yeah, I've got so many and. I can never choose favourites. Um, I have too many favourites. Um, um, oh, I like this idea. Have you ever imagined or written down a plot to rescue Anne from her execution? Personally, I've never written one. I know there are the alternate kind of histories. I can't remember. They, there's that Berlin trilogy, isn't there? Um Laura, Laura Anderson, is it, or Lauren Anderson? Um, I, I've enjoyed her books apart from I really don't like George Boleyn in her books. Um, but that's an alternative uh, history with um, Anne surviving. Um, but no, I've never, I've never actually um, done anything fictional about um, you know Anne not. Um, managing to escape the scaffolds but I do I, I do enjoy some of the alternative uh, historical fiction um Marion was Anne Boleyn ever kind to Princess Mary she was actually I mean there is this idea that Anne Boleyn was a wicked stepmother um, and I can't condone the fact that Anne did support Henry VIII's treatment of Catherine of Aragon and Princess Mary, that, that awful treatment. Henry was the one in control, though. He he was the one um, that was responsible for it. But I can't condone Anne and support of that. But Anne did start off by trying to reach out to Mary. She made several attempts to, to befriend Mary and got rebuffed each time because obviously Mary wanted to be loyal to her mother so Anne did make various attempts and um especially after Catherine you know her, her illness and and death you know trying to to reach out to Mary then and in 1536 when Anne fell there is record of her wishing to send a message she wanted Mary to know just how sorry she was for her part and what happened to Mary. That was something that was on her mind when she was in the tower. And we we know that from from the records. Um, so she she was consumed with with guilt over that. So yes, I can't condone Anne for her part in their treatment. You know, Henry VIII saw them as you know defying uh you know god's anointed king and they deserved all they got for their defiance um and and supported him so um so yes i can't condone that um oh i have a credit to my country thank you uh so yes i'm british but i live in spain so i've embraced spain as my country too um, yes, this, um, my Spanish friends find it very interesting um, that, you know, I, I write about Tudor history. They don't actually know much about the Tudors. Obviously, when I talk to them about Catalina de Aragon, uh, Catherine of Aragon, they go, ah, yes, yes, daughter of the the the, the famous uh, Catholic monarchs. Um, oh, thank you. That's very kind. Um, let's, perhaps I can do one more question. I'm just having a look. Uh, answer those. Oh, I'm trying to find one last one that I can answer. Right, okay, the one last one, and I, I really apologise to those people whose um, whose questions I haven't got to. Why didn't Elizabeth the first marry? I I think, but she she hadn't actually had um, a good sort of good model for for marriage, had she um, with you know, what happened with Henry VIII and his marriages. And 
Robert Dudley talked about how, as a child, um, Elizabeth had said after Catherine Howard's execution that she was never going to marry. But I think Elizabeth saw what happened to her sister, um, Mary I, and her marriage to Philip, just how unpopular that had been. And I think Elizabeth really was in a very tricky position because who could she marry? If she married a foreigner, then it might put England into foreign hands. If she married an Englishman, then she might upset her courtiers. You know, who could she choose without upsetting someone else? And at the time, although she was queen, she was monarch, as a woman, she was still supposed to be kind of subservient uh, to um, her husband, um, and yet she was monarch. So it was a very, very tricky position. And I think Elizabeth decided to be married to her country instead. So, yes, I, I think that um, Elizabeth made the sensible choice. It obviously meant that the Tudor line could not continue um, and that was the sacrifice that had to be um, made. So, so yes, um, yeah, a, a, a sad state of affairs. I think she just chose the best thing she could for her country. So, um, yes. So, I am going to leave it at that because here it is 1.36 in the morning and I'm not going to make much sense. And already, as I said, my mind's going blank about things that I normally no so uh so yes so thank you um for the questions um you can find out about um the conference as i said the Anne Boleyn, the woman who changed england at claireridgeway.com i'm just going to see if i can put that slide back on sorry i can't get rid of zach's um comment there because i can't find it again to click on it to go so tickets are available now at claireridgeway.com so do look into that amberlyn the woman who changed england um so so yes do have a look at that do browse that so thank you oh jennifer said really interesting talk thank you claire so i have thoroughly enjoyed these three days of talking to you um it's been absolutely fabulous and i thank you for your patience with me um for not being able to answer all your questions for your kindness for your kind comments and just for always supporting and encouraging me in what I do. I started, you know, the Amberlynn Files in 2009, and I never could have guessed that it would lead me on such a journey so that I'm now writing books about the Tudors. I'm now doing online conferences. I'm, I'm got a YouTube channel. I'm doing, my life has been consumed by, by the Tudors. And it's because you, it's, it's, it's thanks to you because you are supporting me in that your encouragement means so much. So I just want to say a really, really, really big thank you to you from the bottom of my heart. I'm so very thankful that you encourage me every day. Thank you. Anyway, take care and I'm sure I will see you soon. Um, you know where to find me, the Amber Lynn Files, uh, YouTube. Um, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm everywhere. Um, so, so yes. So take care, keep safe and keep well. And I will leave you to it. Thank you.